for now. We can just start with uh, Thomas Fischmacher, who is online here. Uh, quick comment on the introduction. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm actually uh, sort of uh, fail to be ex string theorist in the sense that I'm still occasionally publishing the odd string theory paper. So I've, I've never really fully <laughs> left that field. Now, uh, let's get started, I would say. Now, I want to talk on this occasion, and, and thanks again for the invitation, about machine learning here and now. And, well, I have to start with a disclaimer, however. So the views that I'm expressing here in this talk are my own and not necessarily those of Alphabet or Google Research. And if you talk to any of my other colleagues at Alphabet, then you might get some similar views, but also perhaps some rather different views. Overall, over here at Google, uh, we consider it uh, important and, and useful to have different valuations and assessments and, and then have discussions about where the differences come from in order to get at the bottom of things. So this is generally considered good for getting a comprehensive picture of a complex topic. And, and this is how we... Uh, uh, make our decisions. Uh, so this this is mostly uh, my personal views and, and not the official position of Google. I'd like to start with a philosophical perspective on what we are doing. Sorry, my voice isn't fully back to normal yet. I'm recovering from a nasty cold. Now, about 100 years ago, Sigmund Freud, well, in a way, he self-proclaimed his work as having delivered a third big blow at uh, humanity's naive self-love. And these blows were Margin marginalizations, or if you want to call them insults, uh, according to way, the way he sees things are, that Copernicus first showed that we are not at the center of the world. Then Darwin showed that we are not separate from the animal world. And, and finally, Freud then claims to, to have made a point that the ego, the human ego, is not even master in its own house. Uh, now, strictly speaking, the first two points were likely first articulated not by Freud, but uh, as close to humanity's narcissism by uh, Emil dubois Raymond, and, and Freud was aware of his uh, work. Uh, the, the slides have a link to details here. Now, overall, AI research might potentially be about to deliver another big blow to humanity's narcissism. So the question here is whether we can maybe demonstrate that human intelligence, let, let's say general intelligence, is really not so special at all. So... Looking at our current trajectory, uh, there's something new going on. Uh, the modern transformer-based architectures that everybody is talking about now that go back to this attention is all you need uh, paper by Google Research and University of Toronto author authors from uh, 2017 clearly started something entirely new. There's a new quality to what we can do with uh, such models. The transformer architecture itself is, however, not that new. The ideas go back, can be traced back to the 90s. I'd like to bring up some caveats about what we are seeing with these architectures. So we are humans are actually very good at seeing what we want to see. And also one observes that most of us are not actually that creative. So in order to properly assess the capabilities of a modern large language model, we are facing a tricky problem because we have to come up with likely never ever seen before questions that, that no one ever uh, brought up or, or where, where there cannot possibly be anything online about them. And we might ourselves not realize that when we bring up a question that we think is new, we, we didn't invent a genuine question, but it's based on something that we saw earlier and forgot about. And, and this then easily can create an illusion of a model having cognitive ability that it actually doesn't possess. So one of my personal pet questions to pose to a LLM, and it's kind of a template uh, uh, mold for uh, coming up with similar questions. I didn't invent this one, is the question whether one can see outer space from the Great Wall of China. And it's very interesting and revealing what answers one typically gets from the uh, big, uh, uh, famous uh, large language models that, that are around and available uh, these days. Now here, I don't want to speculate too much on the future, mostly because we really have no idea where this uh, would be going. So, so no speculations about artificial general intelligence, AGI here. So rather, let's focus on the present and what's possible uh, right now. 
Now, what do we actually do with uh, machine learning? Uh, I have the following perspective on this. So there, there's this famous article by Eugene Wigner on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, where he makes the point that mathematics works very well to describe nature. And this is a gift that we neither deserve nor understand. So Eddington made an interesting comment about this by offering the following parable. Uh, so uh, Eddington brought, brought up the story that, that some men went fishing in the sea with a net. And upon examining what they caught, they concluded that there was a minimum size to the fish in the sea. So of course, mathematics works well to describe things for which mathematics works well. And in that sense, mathematics is just a fishing net as in this story, and it will not allow us to catch some fish. So to give a specific example, let's imagine we have a thousand by a thousand pixel black and white image, and we want to formulate the question whether that image shows a shark. This is extremely hard to write down. No one would have the idea of trying, even trying to write this down as a function from a one million dimensional vector space to a Boolean value, true, false, or zero, one. And what we see here is that machine learning is a different fishing net with which we can catch fish that uh, we cannot catch with uh, what we had before. And, and this makes it very interesting, of course. So in general, the, the way I like to phrase it, machine learning is typically what we use <clears throat> when we have to concede defeat on the algorithmic front. So the typical situation is that we cannot or cannot yet formulate a proper complex algorithm proper compact algorithm to tackle a problem. And then what we can do is to take a step back and asking ourselves, well, are we asking uh, the right question? Are, are we uh, asking for the right problem here? So could we maybe say we, we don't want a solution or, or we are content with a solution that doesn't fully show its work in uh, explainable and justifiable human verifiable form. And uh, perhaps are we content with uh, probably approximately correct answer? They can be a bit off, but with high likelihood is not much off. And if the answer here is yes, then machine learning uh, will be an interesting idea. So it, it then has often new things uh, we can do about such problems. And, and this is generally how uh, uses for machine learning arise. Another way to think about machine learning, in particular as a tool in research, is that it is a kind of telescope. So um, often what we do with machine learning is just running inference so cheaply and quickly classifying thousands or millions of examples. So this, this is often useful, but actually there's more that machine learning has to offer. Overall, science all over the place is using sense-enhancing technology, and this can be as simple as a thermometer or a properly calibrated analytical balance. In astronomy, we are using telescopes to see far away structure, simplified perspective here. And uh, we can also say that machine learning, one, one way to view machine learning is that it is a tool like a telescope that allows us to see high dimensional structure, very high dimensional structure, because humans are not good at visualizing that. So one clear use is that we can apply it to ANOVA style analysis, uh, asking the question how well we can predict some particular target given well, a full set of features or then some subset of features, how much do we lose if we eliminate some features. And machine learning can also uh, do this if there are nonlinear relations, whereas uh, the, the uh, more basic tools uh, in elementary statistics would, would mostly focus on linear relations. So for maths related problems, what you often find is that via using machine learning, we can understand a problem better and often even to the point where it then falls apart and we can tackle it without a need for machine learning anymore. And then it would not be visible that on our path to arrive to certain insights, there was machine learning involved that pushed us forward. So uh, looking at current challenges, the advances that we've seen in machine learning have opened many to us. And overall, I would say that in engineering, the biggest challenge may well be in developing a good I for machine learning or machine learning technology might allow us to meaningfully do things better or in new ways. And to give a 
specific example here where this is non-obvious, let's look at the question what machine learning can do for databases. And uh, the first idea one might have is that with uh, transformer-based large language models, one can do things like, for example, taking a natural language description of some database query, uh, automate synthesizing some SQL code, SQL code, uh, that then can be sent to the database engine uh, that would retrieve the corresponding data. And overall, this is just one of many examples where we would then be seeing a shift from activities that, that are mostly focusing on typing towards activities that are much more about reviewing. So uh, th there would be much more code that is not human generated, but generated with uh, machine learning AI power tools. And it's then a human's task to reason about that code, review that code, and, and overall, I would say I'm incidentally doing a lot of code reviewing myself at Google that reasoning about code often requires higher cognitive ability than writing it in the first place. To show how it's very easy to overlook many relevant other opportunities, I'd like to bring up a paper from 2017 by Kraska et al. And here et al. actually includes Jeff Dean, who was the head of Google Research until recently, the case for learned index structures. So the point they are making in this paper is uh, they are demonstrating that uh, speeding up tree lookups, in particular B-tree lookups with learned heuristics, so in a way machine learning by based heuristics, is indeed feasible. It's somewhat non-trivial, but uh, it can produce rather relevant performance gains. The challenge here is that machine learning models typically have quite a few weights but if we are going for performance, we are constrained on what we can afford to compute. We can only do so many floating point operations uh, until uh, this uh, then in itself becomes a major constraint that, that would nullify any performance gains uh, we would get from being more clever. But in this paper, we've shown that this can actually work for databases. And by better prediction, uh, were to look in a B tree, it can give uh, quite noticeable, quite nice uh, performance enhancements. So overall, with machine learning, we are currently in a period of rapid innovation. And one quite plausible possible scenario is that 20 years from now, we, we, we don't know where the world will go in 20 years, but, but it's plausible that we would look back to the 20s of the 21st century with hindsight on which ideas were great, which were dead's end. And probably we would write some amusing books about how people played around with different ideas explored and, and how this exploration often went in unpromising directions. And I tend to liken this to the beginning of the 20, 20th century, the Edwardian period, 1901 to 1910, and, and maybe the end of the Victorian period, where we also saw a phase of rapid innovation. And, and I just want to present two innovations from that time. On the left, we see the Stolzl flying machine. So, so this was an attempt to build a heavier than air flying apparatus with flapping wings. And that, that didn't really work, but people played around with such ideas. And uh, one thing they found uh, to be viable and promising. And, and then they could uh, evolve further while engineering design was the right flyer. So this, this could demonstrate stable flight. And uh, this is, of course, what then our airplanes evolved from. Now, let's focus a bit more on overlooked opportunities. And I would like to make the point that we should distinguish between two things here. The, the first one is proper machine learning. And, and the other thing is the technology that has been built to power it. And we have a similar situation actually with a GPUs graphics processing units. So they are nowadays widely used for numerical computations and research, not only machine learning, also, also other research. And many of these users have nothing to do whatsoever with graphics, even though there's still graphics in the name GPU. And it was gaming that created a mass market that made uh, floating point numerics very affordable uh, via us now having GPUs. And quite similarly, uh, there's infrastructure that's powering machine learning. And there are some amazing tools that allow us to solve many problems with little effort uh, that, that would have been tedious to solve in the past. And I'll show a concrete example in a moment. Um, the point here is that every STEM student 
I would say, should feel enabled to solve the basic 1,000 parameter optimization problem numerically only, even if they only have limited programming experience, unless the problem is in some form malicious, but, but most such optimism, optimization problems are not. And I'll present a concrete example. So let's specifically look at SIG POVM, symmetric, informationally complete, positive operator valued measures. Uh, that's quite a mouthful, but the idea here is that if we look at a quantum mechanical two-state system, then we can describe its pure states in terms of emission projection operators. So the operator being a projection means that it squares the same as the operator. And um, well, it's, it's a, a density matrix, a, a quantum state. Uh, so we can build it by tensoring a cat with a bra. Now, uh, for a two-state system, these uh, pure states operator matrices, uh, we can understand as being of the form n vector times sigma, where n vector is a three-dimensional unit vector. So it points to a point on the surface of the uh, two sphere, the, the surface of the unit uh, radius, a three-dimensional ball. And sigma is a formal vector of the Pauli spin matrices. Now, there's a set of four pure states and looking at the vector n, uh, the, the normal vector that contains the same information, uh, these uh, geometrically can be visualized as sitting at the corners of a regular tetrahedron, the, the vertices of a regular tetrahedron. So uh, we, we have a set of four and four is the maximum number here of equiangular pure states so that if we use one such projection operator to prepare a quantum state and then another one to do measurements, then for any such pair of different, if you want so consecutive measurements, the probability distribution would be the same. So the, these are equiangular states. For two state systems, this is fairly clear to see, but it generalizes to n state systems. So for n equals three, we then have not two squared, but three, three squared, nine quantum states. And in each of them has three complex parameters, but of course there's a redundant phase, which we can model out. And then also here we have equiangular measurement or projection operators. And there's quite a bit known for n larger than three. And, and we have some constructions for rather large n larger than a hundred. But a general proof that this works for every n that we always find in square such states is missing. Here I would just take this as a toy example for, for showing how easy it is actually to find uh, solutions to such a problem if we phrase it as an optimization problem and, and throw some machine learning tech at it. So for n equals 6, as I said, we are looking for a 6 squared. So that is 36 complex 6 vectors with 12 parameters each. Let's forget about length normalization and the phase for now. And, and let's just phrase it as, as, as a simple uh, problem without extra constraints. So can we find such vectors that give us equiangular quantum states? And on the next slide, I will show how to wire this up using uh, the open source JAX library that Google published, uh, using just under 30 lines of what looks like Python code. There's a uh, well, a, a bit of tricky detail to this, but, but nominally this looks as Python code and it can be understood as Python code. But nevertheless, the actual calculation, calculation will still be fast. It may be put on a GPU, it may run a GPU, and it's definitely then not running at the speed of the rather slow Python interpreter. So what we have here is 6 to the third times 2, so 2 times 216, that's 432 real parameters. And, and, and still, so even though it's a sort of high dimensional optimization problem, this is still very accessible to, to uh, most students even. And what this also means that is that, that we might look, be looking at a way here to revolutionize physics education because we are no longer as constrained as we have been in the past to only go with symbolic expressions, to only look at systems that have uh, reasonably nice and compact uh, symbolic description, but we can also now study phenomena via simulation, which gives us a different window on the actual physics. Physics doesn't care about uh, symbolic expressions, actually. And so whatever we are looking into and then how we are studying systems, we can very often easily supplement this with fast simulations. For, for example, to illustrate the uh, body and cooper schrieffer mechanism for uh, superconductivity, uh, to, to explore and explain how a diode works as a thermodynamic device, look into fluid dynamics, <coughs> uh, and, and many more such applications upon. 
So here's the actual code. As I said, it's just under 30 lines of Python code and then with comments on timings. I first import a few libraries, number JX, uh, software optimization. I tell JX that I want binary 64 double precision floating point. And well, then I set up this matrix of traces of products of two projection operators. And this I can work out. So if, if I know that the set of quantum states should be equiangular, then I know what these traces of products, what, what kind of matrix this should be. And it has a reasonably simple form that's a sum of a matrix of all ones and, and then something different that happens on the diagonal. Overall, what I'm doing in the end, let's focus on line 23, is that I'm calling the uh, BFGS Optimizer, minimizer, uh, Brighton Fletcher Golf Up Shano, I think. So, uh, this is a second one optimization method that uh, generally works well for problems of, of dimensionality up to about 5,000. I've used it. We start from a random initial position and uh, we are using fast gradients, which we get via reverse mode automatic differentiation, here provided by the JAX library. Uh, which, however, translates the loss function in such a way that we get um, something that, that actually is fast code that can execute uh, even on a GPU or if we execute it on CPU, it, it uses uh, compiled operations. So the loss function itself, or well, the objective function, if we use not machine learning, but numerical optimization terminology is the square of the difference of a target and, and something that we get from our parameters. Uh, here we would get it as something complex. So we are taking uh, the real part. We know it to be real. So, so the imaginary part will be zero. And, and then we sum these entries. So this is just a squared distance here. And well, I have to build this matrix from the optimization parameters, which come as a coordinate vector of, of length. Uh, 432. So what this get psi mij does is that it first takes this optimization parameter vectors, uh, reshapes it, uh, forms a complex vector of half the length from it, and then reshapes it into, well, in this case, six dimensional vectors, uh, 36 in total. And uh, then we are working out the projection operators and, uh, well, the, the uh, corresponding uh, products of these. And um, in, in this way, solving this problem on the laptop that I'm using to do the presentation right now, this takes just under two seconds. Uh, if I don't provide F prime, it takes about 12 seconds. So uh, six times more and uses many more evaluations. But both these timings uh, haven't fully amortized yet the effort to do the just-in-time compilation of, of the underlying functions into fast code. So if I had to call the, the uh, uh, numerical functions that I have to evaluate here more often than the timings would get even better. So there are users of machine learning and ML technology that require a rather deep technical background. However, there are also quite a few good opportunities where we can make amazing progress for a creative application of novel tools. Mm, where the issue is that no one thought about deploying uh, this technology like that in that particular place ever before. And even if we are only looking at mathematical research, so there are, there are many places where machine learning inspired methods can be potentially useful. So for example, if I have a problem where I want to know whether it's possible to connect region X to region Y via ODE integration, so whether there's any way how I could get from region X to region Y uh, through a particular ODE, then this is a problem I can study nicely and easily with machine learning inspired methods and, and uh, the technology that was built for machine learning. What we've also seen people looking into is exploring hypotheses like, for example, could there be a formula of the form, there's some X uh, that, that is a function of some other somewhat related y plus perhaps small corrections. <clears throat> and we've seen this, for example, in the paper by Jechala and collaborators from uh, 2019, uh, where they showed that apparently the hyperbolic volume is related to the Jones polynomial and, and not just the color Jones polynomial, where one might expect this uh, of a particular knot. 
Now, if we are looking at a particular discretization of physics, let's, let's say we are doing a finite element-based simulation, then one question one could pose is whether machine learning could speed up things by giving us a uh, good but still reasonably cheap to compute initial guess for a field configuration, which would then via optimization be turned into a solution to the equations of motion. And well, <clears throat> also a question we can pose is whether it might be feasible to learn a coordinate diffeomorphism that makes a complicated problem numerically more tractable. So there are quite a few such applications. And uh, to conclude, I would like to make the point, this, this is my key message for this talk, that seeing meaningful opportunities to improve the state of the art with either machine learning or the technology that was built for machine learning can be rather subtle. And quite often there are non-obvious good ideas, which however only surface when we think deeply about the problem and do not just uh, stop with the first idea that we have how one could apply machine learning. So the, uh, as, as people who play chess say, uh, if you found a good move, what you do is you should be looking for an even better one. And with this, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for a very clear talk. Uh, do we have any questions for our speaker? Okay, then maybe I've got a question. So you sure. think that uh, machine learning would be useful in, for example, physics education. Yes. In, in what way would machine learning go beyond just uh, sort of a simple numerical method? So, so, so what does machine learning add in addition to just doing uh, normal numerics? Well, the first obvious thing is that it um, makes the numerics much more accessible to students. So nowadays, you only have to know a bit of Python and you can easily set up a rather complicated simulation. So <clears throat> just by making simulations more accessible via machine learning technology, we can already do quite a lot, but there's more uh, that we can look into. So for example, I myself uh, have had some quite good experience and success with things like uh, TSNI embeddings, for example. So uh, showing how complicated behavior looks like if uh, you, you then actually can project down from some high dimension into something uh, that is easier to make sense of. Now, of course, my own uh, perspective here is uh, focusing a bit much on physics and engineering. Uh, but if you're looking more towards the data science uh, end of things, then um, uses of uh, machine learning approaches, well, Disney is, is just one unsupervised uh, learning, well, one, one approach that, that would fall in the rubric of unsupervised learning. So uh, there are quite a few things where machine learning gives us new ways uh, to look at data and discover structure. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.